Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try to get, is this equally visible? Forward, back? Okay. I usually sit over there so I know what it's like to not get to see the chalkboard. Oh. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Okay. If y'all would, do me a favor and go on ahead. If you got your Bible or if you have a digital version of it, or if you have neither, there's a Bible and the underside of the seat in front of you, you can feel free to grab and just go on ahead and flip it open to Zephaniah. And I'm going to give you fair warning. This is going to be a little bit different than normal uh, because we have been going through as we've been going through the Bible chronologically, uh, we've been having to tear through so much material so fast that it's basically been the Bible at a 30,000 foot view. Uh, this morning, though, we have the unusual chance of really settling into a spot and really digging in rather than having to cover like 30 chapters in 30 minutes. So this is a very, very short book, and it's three chapters. And if you sat down, if I were to just stand here and read it aloud, we could probably be done in about 10 minutes, uh, which is why... Uh, and don't blame me, blame God. Uh, the every, t every which way I tried to wrestle with this thing, I couldn't find any other way of doing this aside from literally just working through the book. Amen. So um, we're going to use the chalkboard for a little bit. And then once I'm all done with it, we're going to move this board. And uh, there will be a whole lot of scripture on the screen behind me. And it'll be a bit more reading the, than usual this morning. But it'll be fine. It'll be good. It'll be good. So this, and we've had a week or two since we've really uh, talked about where we're at. I mean, you've heard a whole lot of Isaiah, and then we had a little bit of a departure last week. Um, so I'm not going to blame you, because there's so much happening at this point in the Bible. And there's two different timelines in the Bible happening at this point that if you're just confused, and you have no idea what's going on, I don't blame you. So, to kind of set up what's happening here, this is the book of Zephaniah. And probably like maybe a handful of you, when I first heard somebody tell me, because this is like probably the least read portion of your Bible, that's not a pot shot. That's like, that's just an obvious statement. Because the first, I was like 15, and somebody told me there was a book in the Bible called Zephaniah. And I was like, no, there's not. <laughs> Stop that. Because it sounds too conspicuously close to Zechariah, so you think they're lying to you. Or like when I heard about Obadiah. I was like, that's a guy from Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yes, Zephaniah is a tiny little prophet. He's one of the minor prophets, and he's the last guy to talk before Judah goes into exile. And so we're at the point where, and we haven't talked about this for a little bit, but a little while back we talked about King Josiah. He's a very, very young king. He is a child king. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but scholars think he probably got to the throne somewhere between 8 to 10 years old. So he had to be surrounded by a group of trustworthy counselors. Otherwise, he could be very easily manipulated. Zephaniah was one of those, because right there in verse 1, 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And it's interesting that he would name four generations. That's not a typical thing you'd see. Well, he does that because Hezekiah is one of the other kings. So Zephaniah is not only a prophet, he is the king's cousin. Which means he is in the inner circle and has the unique responsibility of not just being a prophet to the nation, but also being a prophet that has the king's ear. And whenever we get to the other prophets, you'll realize that's kind of a rare thing. Most of them are usually just shouting out to the ether and nobody's listening. So what we've got at this point, we're in like the 600s-ish BC, not ish, we are, BC. And um, Israel 
The last time I drew this map, I accidentally called Israel a piece of bacon. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> So it's uh, Israel is kind of weirdly oblong shaped. I'm not going to get a super specific map, but it's kind of, you know, a weird trapezoid somewhere in the Middle East. And uh, if we go over here, this is the Mediterranean Sea. You got somewhere up here is the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus hung out a lot. Over here, you have the Dead Sea. And if we were to go down this direction, you'd end up in Egypt. And then over here is just the rest of Asia, Mesopotamia, the stuff that Paul calls Asia Minor in the New Testament. And by this point, this much of the nation has already seceded off and become Israel. They took the name. That's just not polite. When they left, they even took the name. And their capital was Samaria. And then down here, Benjamin and Judah became Judah. And this is where David's kingly line wound up which is these two tribes down here in the lower chunk of what was left of the nation. But by this point in history, Assyria has already come in from over here, kind of in the modern-day Turkey region, and they've already conquered all this. So Israel is no more. This is just now land that's been vassaled by the Assyrian Empire. And Josiah is now a young king who's just discovered the book of Deuteronomy and has had it read to him and realizes he and his people are in a worse position than he ever thought and is desperately trying to do reforms. And Zephaniah probably had some influence on that with the words that he has to say. But while Assyria is up here being the global superpower at this point, because they've gone through and they've conquered everything that they can, with the exception of, like, Judah, a handful of people who lived on the coast, and like Egypt. But that's because there's a whole desert between them and Egypt. It's kind of hard to get there. So while that's happening over here, way, it's, it's way off the map. But way over here, kind of in the modern day Iraq region, we have a little kingdom you may or may not have heard of called Babylon. And they're slowly getting influence. And eventually, they're going to be the big guy on the block that goes through and takes everybody's stuff. And this is the thing that Zephaniah is trying to warn everybody about. He doesn't get Babylon by name, but he knows God has given him a word of saying something is coming. Something big and bad is coming, and it's way worse than we've ever thought. And it's even going to make Assyria look like chopped liver. Something is coming. And that's where, that's where we pick up. This is a very tumultuous time with just some threat looming. And we're going to move this out of the way so maybe everybody can see the scripture. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for you all over here. I hope you have your body. It's just no man's land with the chalkboard and the screen. There's just nothing we can do. Maybe we can get like a big mirror put up over here for you all. But if we pick up right at verse 1, 2, where it says this, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind. I will cut them off from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off I will I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal in the name of the idolatrous trees, uh, of the idolatrous priests, along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of the heavens, and to those who bow down and swear to both the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So here we've got two very different things happening. One, Zephaniah is sort of setting the stage for what kind, exactly what kind of judgment is coming up here. Because whenever he talks, I don't, I don't know if he caught the order of that, where he says, I will sweep away men, then I will sweep away beasts, then I will sweep away fish and birds 
and then the earth itself. That sounds an awful lot like the exact order God created everything in. First, he creates continents, then fish, then birds, then beasts, then men. God is saying he is going to systematically undo the good earth that he made because of all of this idolatry. It says here that there is a remnant of Baal or Baal. And Baal, if you worship Baal, you automatically worship Asherah. They're a set. They're a fertility god and goddess. They're husband and wife. And if you worship one, you're going to worship the other. And then it also says Milcom, which some scholars believe is just a different way of saying Molech, another really bad pagan deity. But on top of that, they're already getting the beginnings of something else that's going to be a problem in the book of Ezekiel, where it says those who get on their roofs and worship the hosts of the heavens. So this is a little bit obscure, but it helps you whenever you read some of this stuff where they talk about stars and the sun and stuff like that throughout the prophets. In the minds of the ancient Middle Eastern people, when they looked up and saw stars and the stars would move in these predictable patterns and they would come and go with seasons, they were thinking that these were somehow like little physical glimpses of the glory of different deities. And so whenever they were mapping out stars, they honestly thought they were mapping out the trajectories of deities. That's why a lot of these ancient cultures are so fascinated with star maps. And so now they're worshiping stars and particularly the sun. People would get up early in the morning and worship the sun. And by the time Ezekiel's day comes around later on in history, there's a full-blown sun cult established in Israel. And all of this, it's saying, but for those who swear by both the Lord, so Yahweh, and by Molech, or Milcom. So not only are they having these idolatrous things on the side, they're mixing them in with the worship of Yahweh. This stuff is happening in Yahweh's holy spaces. And so because of that, we are going to get a drastic, drastic form of judgment that is called, a word we're going to hear repeated a lot from this point in the prophets and throughout, the day of the Lord. So we're going to pick up at verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on that day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold, those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry can be heard from the fish gate, and a wail will be heard from the second quarter of the city, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of mortar, for all of the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will do no, no good, nor will he do ill. And so keep that phrase in the back of your mind from now until we hit the New Testament, that phrase, the day of the Lord. You're going to be hearing it a lot. And the day of the Lord is always a two-part event. And we'll get to the second part of that event later. But the first part of, that's always with the day of the Lord is some form of reckoning. And it's always described as a very intense form of reckoning. This is not your mama slapped you on the back of the hand. This is big deal earth-shattering stuff, we're going to undo the goodness of creation. And it's coming for everybody. This is the guy who's preaching to the king. And he says, God is going to bring punishment on all of the king's sons. Because Josiah was the last good king of Judah. 
So all of his heirs, and not just his heirs, but the people who put themselves in expensive foreign clothing. So the rest of his counselors, the rest of his advisors, the rest of the wealthy and the elite. And it's not even just them. It's going to be the people who work in the blue collar sections of town and the markets. And it's not going to be just them. It's going to be those people who have been worshiping false gods. And it's not even just the people who've been worshiping false gods. It's the people who don't even care about God at all. I don't know if they're just jaded and they've seen too much of life or maybe they're just not spiritual people. But they sit there and God literally calls them complacent. And they don't think God is going to do either good or evil. They're kind of quasi-deists. Like if he's there, he's not doing much for me. So this is like the third guy this week I've heard preach doom and gloom. Whatever, man, nothing's going to happen. Then it goes on at verse 13. Their goods shall be plundered, their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, and it's hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all of the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make the inhabitants of the earth. God is not holding back any longer. And it's, we're, it's not going to let up anytime soon here. We still got two more chapters to go, but we have to pause in this moment and look at this, rec, this description that God gives of himself as a jealous, consuming fire and that makes us squeamish. We don't like it. In lack of a better word, it sounds mean and bitter and we just it, it makes us kind of go, eh, I don't like that. I'm just going to flip back to love is patient, love is kind, and keep reading First John. Because that makes me feel better, and I don't have to wrestle with that or try to make this somehow square with happy, clappy Jesus. And yet we have to remember that all at the same time in the book of Hebrews, they pull these exact words and call Jesus a consuming fire. God didn't suddenly change. He's not schizophrenic. He's one. So this is a part of God we're just going to have to wrestle with and come to terms with. But all this judgment, it's not just coming for Judah. Because then in chapter 2, he starts rounding on all of Judah's neighbors where he says, gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation. And this is his, his warning for Jerusalem that just wait and see what's coming for everybody else. This is a chapter 2. Before the decree that takes effect, before that day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble in the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you may be hidden on that day of the Lord's anger. And keep in mind this, this little group of people here that he just spoke to. Keep them in the back of your mind, this group of, of hidden people. And, not, and it's not hidden. The language there doesn't suggest hidden because like, oh, they just so happened to be overlooked by God. Well, you know, they weren't just the people hiding in the rubble while Godzilla went on the tirade and didn't step on them. This is, the language suggests a little group of people 
that have gone through this turmoil with everybody else, but God has placed them here to look over them and protect them. That's the language we're saying. Keep these hidden people in mind as we move forward. So now he starts talking about all the other people surrounding them. For Gaza shall be deserted. Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven away at noon. And Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you inhabitants of the sea coasts, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you until none of your inhabitants are left. And you, O sea coast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. So understand that all these places he's talking to are little towns that are right here on the edge of the coast or even groups of people that live right here on the sea coast. And they think that there's this sort of buffer for abuse between them and Assyria. It's already going to take so much time to conquer this and all of this that by the time they get to us, it's just sand and ocean water. They don't want us. We'll be fine. And we'll just laugh at the Israelites and the Judeans who had all this power and who've been fighting with us for years and they finally get toppled. No, whatever's coming, it's coming from here all the way out to the coast. Nobody is safe. It is indiscriminate. Everybody is now brothers kind of judgment that's coming. And no matter where you are, it's coming for you. And, but remember those hidden people because then it says this at verse 7. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah on which they will graze. And in the house of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening for the Lord will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. And then he goes back to start rounding in. He says, if they have heard the taunts of Moab and the revelings of the Ammonites, how they taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord, which is one doozy of a thing to say when you're immortal. As I live, declares the hosts of the Lord, the God of Israel, Moab shall be like Sodom and the Anamites shall be like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. And in case you're not familiar with ancient Middle Eastern genealogies, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. I don't expect you to be. Nobody is. Well, there are some, but they're not very fun at parties. Uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites are descendants of Lot. They are very familiar with Israel's stories and history. And God has just told the people that he saved from Sodom and Gomorrah, you're no better than them. And you will be made like them. A waste forever. And once again, the remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them for he will famish all of the gods of the earth and to him shall bow down each in its place all the lands of the nations. So he is going to dominate and put into submission all other gods in the land and all of the cities that represent them in their glory. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy, catch this, Assyria. So up to this point, everybody's probably been thinking Assyria is going to come in and conquer us all. They're conquering everybody. And it's here where Zephaniah finally reveals Nope, whatever's coming, whatever God has brewing, it's going to destroy the local superpower. The biggest, baddest people on the block are going to topple. And he will make Nineveh a desolation 
a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in their midst. All kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog, shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become. A lair for wild beasts. And everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. So we have the city of Nineveh. A city that God, mind you, not too long ago just spared from destruction through the prophet of Jonah. Is now putting itself on par with God by using the exact same identifier that God does. Saying, I am. And none other can exist before my might. And they probably had a good reason to think so. They conquered most of the known world. And they had these thick, high walls that nobody could get through to get into Nineveh. Their capital city was impossible to penetrate this place. Nobody could do it. Nobody had done it before. The walls were so vast, it would take you three days to walk all the way around their battlements. The city had a reason to boast, and God's saying he's just going to level it. In the very beginning of chapter 3, we get one final bit of warning to both Jerusalem and everybody else. Starting at chapter 3, it says, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled. This is Jerusalem, the oppressing city. So now God's people are the defiled, oppressive people. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are like roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing until the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy, and they do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. I will cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste to their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. And this is God talking to the nation. Surely you will fear me and you'll accept this correction then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you, but you were all the more eager to make their deeds corrupt. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I seize the prey, for my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble kingdoms, and to pour out upon them my indignation, all of my burning anger. And again, we get this exact same language. For in the fire of my jealousy, all of the earth shall be consumed. Total, global, everybody from the most powerful of the powerful to the lowliest of the low will be gathered together and there is a day of reckoning. And everybody is equally leveled under it. And God deliberately calls himself now twice a fire that will consume the earth. And for a lot of us, we're still in this kind of bit of discomfort where we don't know what to do with this, right? We might go out 
and try to tell somebody about Jesus, about God, about how loving he is, and then somebody who might have been jaded and hurt by church people, or they just particularly don't care for religion or whatever their beef is, will come at you with something like this and saying, what do you do with that? And you're just, I, I don't know. Because this seems a bit harsh. This seems a bit much, Right? It feels uncomfortable that the God we think of as the God of love and mercy would be talking about pouring out blood as numerous as dust is on the earth, which in case you didn't notice, the Middle East is rather dusty. So a lot. Talking about people's flesh being like dung. This doesn't feel right. But we have we can't just we can't just bump over it and move on. We kind of have to wrestle with it for a bit. So what what do we do with that? And so and I the things that the Bible offers up. I'm going to give you the warning. You're never going to fully feel just a hundred percent settled with it because there's an aspect of faith of trusting that God knows what He's doing. But we're going to wrestle with this a little bit, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Because there, there are three things here that I kind of want us to remember whenever we try to deal with this, of what it's like to, to answer this question of why. Why does God go this far? Why is all of this necessary? And let me, sorry guys, I mean, it kind of happens anyways in the book, but I'm, that was a dark joke. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but... Why? Why is this so necessary? And so the first thing we have to remember is, is and if you don't get anything else out of the sermon, just write down these, these three points. Uh, one, uh, Israel agreed to this. Okay? They agreed to it. And before you wonder why the heck would anybody agree to be uh, wiped away, just understand, they did agree to this. Because all the way back, you might not remember it, it's been a hot minute since we were there in Deuteronomy in chapter 30, and like the chapter surrounding it, uh, Moses tells the people, hey, uh, if you follow the covenant, this covenant, if you agree to it, you're going to get all these blessings. They're great, guys. There's a lot of blessings. And then immediately behind that, there's a list that's two or three times as long of the numerous curses that can come upon you if you don't keep the covenant. And Moses even looks them in the face and says, yeah, and you're going to get some of these blessings, and you're also going to get all the curses, and God is going to disperse you out among the nations just like he said he would. It's going to happen. They knew they were going to fail. They were told point blank to their faces, you're going to fail if you agree to this, and it's going to be bad. And they agreed to it anyways. It's a covenant. It's a legally binding agreement. It's like whenever you go to the bank and you offer up something as collateral, they're probably not going to be nice and just not take it. You're legally obligated to give it once you stop paying. They agreed to this. They knew it was a possibility. So they really have nobody at this point to blame but themselves because they are reaping what they asked for. The second thing we need to keep in mind is that multiple times throughout all of these books, throughout all the Old Testament, and, and even in this book, in Zephaniah, God reminds people that he is just. So whatever he's doing, it seems much, it seems drastic, it seems harsh, and yet... God is calling it justice. And a lot of us don't like that because the only thing we know of as far as God goes in a lot of our culture is just mercy, is just acceptance. That's it. That's the only thing we ever hear about. You're considered horrible, awful, bigoted if you think of anything other than mercy than, or acceptance. And yet all at the same time, God does an awful lot of things that we probably don't like and he calls them justice. Because if he's just, you can't just ignore something. Okay? That's, that's, not how, that's not how justice works. You don't just ignore it. 
If I were walking down the hallway and I accidentally bumped into Isaac, Adam, being a good and just dad, would be like, that's okay. And I would say, excuse me. And he would be like, say, it's okay, it's okay. And we would go our ways. Now, if Adam came down the hallway and he saw somebody my size drop kicking Isaac down the rest of the hallway, he as a good and just father would make sure I'm a splat on the floor. We have this innate understanding inside of us that justice is sometimes mercy and then other times it looks like a splat on the floor. And we still might think, well, so much blood that it looks like the dust on the earth and people's skin being dung might sound still harsh to us. I don't think we fully understand just how far Judah and Israel had gone at this point. When you worship Baal and you worship Asherah, they are, fertility means more than your crops. Yeah. There are wee ears in the room, so I'm trying to be PG. Some of it is anatomical, if you're catching my drift. And some of it is that anatomy is now used in your worship with multiple people, sometimes unwilling people who are very young. There is, with Molech, usually living sacrifices. Some of them are infants. Yep. Judah has gone very, very far. But before we get a little bit too comfortable in thinking, well, that's good because I've never worshipped the fertility god or goddess and I've never made a living sacrifice of an infant and things like that. Uh, even if you haven't, and I would argue that we have equivalencies in our culture that are going on right now, some of one of which is very much so in the political spotlight. Um, Jesus comes in and tells us, you, it doesn't matter whether you're offering up a living sacrifice or whether you're just angry. It's all murder. Whether you've been in the temple using the anatomy that the fertility deities tell you to use or whether or not you just looked a little too long at somebody on the sidewalk, it's all adultery. Because whenever we take a good, cold, hard look at what justice is, we still get squeamish because we realize that all this time, the just God has given us chance after chance after chance after chance. There are so many times in the last few hundred years up to this point in the Bible, Israel did something stupid, and God was about ready to wipe them out, and somebody prays for them, and God says, fine, I won't. It's happened so many times. And now after a few hundred years worth of second chances, we're now to this point where we can't look away any longer. I would say a few hundred years of second and third and fourth chances, the mercy threshold, the second chance threshold might have very well been met about, you know, 75 years, like at least halfway through that. But God holds off for hundreds of years. And now we're finally to the point of reckoning and we still don't like it, but yet it's justice. And even whenever we know something is just, we don't like it. Now, how many times have we just, now we reap the benefits of our own bad behavior and we know it's our own bad behavior in our heart of hearts and yet we still try to find every other reason why it's not our fault when we're called to the mat. So even whenever we know it's good and it's just, we still don't like it. But we have to understand that God is just and it's, it's who he is. It's in his character. He's always going to act according to his character. And even if we feel strange and uncomfortable about it, we have to understand that we're tainted to sin and we have to have a level of faith that even if we don't get it, even if we don't like it, whatever's going on, it's just. And then here's the third point. of Why all of this judgment? Why go so far? And it's, if you don't take anything else home, this is the thing I want you to remember, okay? The big thing I want you to remember, and it's the thing that Zephaniah wants you to remember from this whole, whole book, is that your pain 
has a purpose. If you don't get anything else, remember this, just right here. Your pain has a purpose. If you recall what I said earlier, there's always a two-part thing to this day of the Lord language. It always comes in two parts. The first part is reckoning. And it looks an awful lot like this. You deliberately entered into a covenant. You didn't keep it. And after all of the second and third and fourth and just the infinite number of chances you had, now justice must be done. And yet... Your pain has a purpose. It's not meaningless. And it's not just God being some old, sadistic man in the sky who gets some weird sense of pleasure out of making people hurt. That's not what's going on here. And you'll see what I mean. If we pick back up in chapter 3, starting at verse 9, And we'll see what the second part of the day of the Lord looks like. It says, for at that time, and this is after everything has been annihilated. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. So somehow, some way, after all of this hurt and judgment and bad, everybody's coming together and speaking as one and doing the right thing as one. This sounds an awful lot like Babel, but different. People aren't coming together to build some big giant structure to themselves and think of themselves as God. Rather... God is bringing everybody together from all of these nations that have experienced his justice and they're all speaking one language and they're worshiping God together in agreement because they're of one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. So those dispersed, exiled peoples, he's slowly bringing back. On that day, you shall not be put to shame, because the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly, They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they will graze and lie down. None shall make them afraid. So... Somehow, some way, after all this judgment, people seem to be genuinely and heartfeltly worshiping God. It doesn't use language like they've been forced to be here, like they're under Yahweh's boot. No. They're, they're willingly here and worshiping from all of their heart. And all of this stuff that made them go through the judgment in the first place, the idolatry, the greed, the oppression, the abuse, all of it has been lifted out from them, pulled out of them. Because God says there's nothing left here but your goodness and your righteousness. And that's just his people it says in verse 14, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all of your heart. 
O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you, and he has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you in gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with a loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all of your oppressors. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all of the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, I will make you renowned and praised among all of the peoples of the earth. And I will restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the second half that's always coming with the day of the Lord. Anytime you hear of the day of the Lord and you hear of the reckoning, you get the second half, which is always, always restoration. There's never one without the other. The language describes that God's justice is necessary for the restoration. You do not get a good and humble and loving people without the justice. You don't get one without the other. Because fire consumes, but fire also purifies. Scripture at other points describes God as smelting impurities out of his people the way you smelt other foreign bodies out of gold and silver by heating them up and melting them down, extracting what is wrong, and then letting it cool back to the perfect shape that you want it. And this was always the intent. It's always the intent if, uh, remember how I told you in Deuteronomy, Moses predicts that they're not going to keep this covenant in chapter 30. And this is where we can pull up Deuteronomy 30 up there on the slides where it says this. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them in mind among... Uh, uh, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you out and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore to you your fortunes and have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all of the peoples where the Lord had scattered you. And then down at verse 6 in Deuteronomy, it says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. The same man who predicted they were going to fall tells them, but that's okay. Because after that, God is going to to restore you. Because he made an agreement as well in that same covenant that he would never leave them. And by never leaving you, that doesn't just mean he's never going to leave you in your time of hardship. That's, that's true. But by not leaving his people, he also meant he was not going to leave you in a state of lowliness. He's not going to just make you feel good about the fact that you're dying. He's not going to leave you in sin and just say, yeah, good enough. They feel a little bit better about themselves today. He won't leave you there. He refuses to leave you there because he's just And that same language in the book of Hebrews, where it says that God is a consuming fire, it also says this. And 
Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you will have to endure, for God is treating you as a son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for good, that we may share in his holiness. From, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And it's later in verse 28 and following where it says, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God our acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Your pain serves a purpose. And it's, it's all of our hurt. It's all of our hardship. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that God is just the big sadistic dad in the sky who just wants and is just waiting for the chance to pounce on people because he likes disciplining them. And it's not like that kind of, you know, God's not trying to beat you into shape like Rocky Balboa or something. Like He's not Mr. Miyagi just cracking you over the head with stuff, trying to make you better because if I hit you enough times, you might toughen up, champ. Like that's not what this is. Because even in that description that I just read to you from Hebrews, the Hebrews didn't do anything wrong. They were just being persecuted by their neighbors and by the government. And yet God still says, this is me sharpening you. Whenever Israel deliberately sins and the day of the Lord comes, he says, I'm sharpening you and I'm with you. When his people sat back and did nothing wrong, they were just worshiping him. He tells them, I'm with you. I'm sharpening you. Your pain is not meaningless. It has a purpose. And some of us would think, well, why doesn't God just take my pain away? That would be a whole lot better if he just takes it away. I don't like it. And yet all at the same time, if you didn't have pain, things would be worse. Because if I offered you to live the rest of your life without ever feeling pain ever again, you might take that deal. And yet, if you didn't feel any pain, you might not feel excruciating pain in your stomach that tells you that your appendix is about ready to rupture and kill you. If you set your hand on something extremely hot and your skin is coming off, you might not realize it because you don't have pain. Pain is there to alert you that something isn't right. And we don't like it, but it has... A purpose, And God takes it and says, this, this hurt, this pain that could have been meaningless, that could have just been arbitrary, which is all pain is, that there is no God and there's nothing but meatballs floating through space. I don't know why people think what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's just killing you a little bit faster because there's no point to it. But God is saying, I'm taking that thing that seems meaningless, that seems arbitrary, and rather than just simply lifting it from you because you need it to know if something is horribly wrong, I'm going to redeem it and make it serve my people to make them better, to make them stronger, to make them holy. It's not just behavioral modification. God isn't just telling you to be self-flagellating people looking for pain. But when it comes, 
it's not meaningless. And God is just, and he knows what he's doing. And always, always with the pain comes the restoration. It always comes. Because that language that we see at the end of the book of Zephaniah is incredibly similar to the language in Revelation where we get another description of the day of the Lord where it says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name who will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And down a little bit further, Jesus says, I am coming soon. And it's the same words that Zephaniah told us, that the day of the Lord is near and it's hastening quickly. It's coming at us fast and nobody's ready for it. Jesus says nobody will be ready for it. It'll be like a thief in the night. I have no idea whatever it is is going on with you. I mean, I know what's going on with some of you, but not all of you. I have, I don't know, maybe life's just good, and that's a good worship in that. Maybe life is hard, and maybe it's not your fault. I have no idea if, like, if, if, if somebody's hitting you privately when you get home or worse, or if somebody at work is just being abusive, I have no idea. Maybe it's just not your fault. And it's not your fault if that's the case. God tells you it's not meaningless. And maybe, maybe uh, it is your own fault because I've had a lot of times where it is my own fault and your own sin and failures and selfishness and laziness, whatever your particular cocktail of vices are, are coming home to roost. And you don't like it. But it is just. The pain is meaningless. And the Bible tells you, you have a God who doesn't delight in pain, but actually he knows what it's like. Because he came and experienced every kind of pain you could imagine. He experienced sickness. He experienced betrayal and heartbreak. He experienced physical torture and murder. God knows what it's like to experience the day of the Lord. And he's not just inflicting you with something blindly, not knowing what it's like. He says, I know what it is to suffer. But I'm asking you to trust me. Because after Christ suffered, he was restored. And the same promise is made to you that your pain isn't meaningless and that it can be redeemed. And that God is just and he will always act according to his character. Yeah. So we're going to pray and wrestle with that for a moment. And in this time of response, uh, just be honest with God. It's always okay to be honest with God. And uh, if you're in a good spot in life, then praise Him. Maybe you're not, and there is some kind of pain. But just please, it's hard to remember sometimes, but please remember that he will be faithful and that he has agreed from the very beginning to restore you. So if you have something and you need somebody to pray with and wrestle with that together because it's hard to remember or maybe it doesn't feel just and maybe you don't really trust God in this moment, then come grab somebody and we'll pray with you. 
and maybe you do remember, but you're just tired and you need a second wind. Grab somebody, we'll pray with you. Just no matter what, in this time of response, just be honest with God. God, we thank you for this morning, for this time that we have to gather together to worship you, to dig into your Bible deeply, and to try to wrestle with and know and understand all of the parts of you, even the parts that confuse us and frighten us, and trust you that it's good, and to trust you that you're good, and that you didn't bring our pain, but that you could redeem our pain. So that it has meaning, and that our lives could have meaning, and that we can live and live abundantly. So I pray that if there's anybody in this room who has pain or hurt, if they're if they're sick and hurting outside of this room, if they have emotional turmoil work turmoil, relational turmoil, whatever it is, that your spirit would comfort them, give them strength and resolve, that we would trust you, we would just ask you to do only the things that you can do, we pray all this in Jesus' name.